Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, the master of fun and wonder, the existential Mr. Rogers, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am here with Rob Observations, a show about something. This will be Rob Observations episode number, I can't even believe this, 239. My God, I got Gilbert here too. Look, there's Gilbert. Gilbert wants a cookie. Uh, he 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 was begging for me. Well, he doesn't really beg. He just kind of wanted a cookie. Didn't you want a cookie, buddy? I'm going to give Gilbert a cookie. I'll come get it. There you go. These are organic cookies. He loves them. Oh, look who else shows up. Tallulah wants a cookie, too. So you can come get it. Um, there you go, Tallulah. You each get cookies. Anyway, today, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, it's Joker Day. That's right. Joker opens. I haven't seen it yet. As many people who watch the John Campia show know, I will be going after this broadcast. I'll be getting in the car with Elizabeth, and I will be going down to the AMC in Burbank to go see Joker. Uh, deferred, not going into Hollywood to the Cinerama Dome to see it. I don't think I've seen a movie with John Campia and the fellas and girls and everybody since we went and saw Aquaman together. So it's been a while since John and I have seen a movie. Looking forward to it. But Joker is the talk. It's the talk of the genre. Any fan, any of you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post-geek singularity community, who isn't talking about Joker? New York Comic Con is going on. I am not there, but uh, I'm there in spirit. I'm there in spirit, and and I just, I keep thinking about Joker. But before I get into this, I have to remind all of you that, once again, Rob Observations is brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And if you go to their website, at getluckytiger.com, you can buy any of their phenomenal products. Oh, Gilbert wants one. And you can punch in PGS when you check out for Post Geek Singularity, and you will get 20% off of your order. And again, I always recommend the facial scrub or the all-over body wash because it is delightful. So, of course, Joker won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival, which nobody expected. It is getting the critical... The kind of critical, uh, I don't know, uh, love that no comic book film before or probably uh, ever ha has go is going to get. Um, maybe in the future they'll make a movie that that uh, does, but who knows? And one of the very interesting things I think about Joker is that even though it's inspired and, of course, based on the character of Joker from Batman comics and films and, and television, a character that's existed for more than half a century. Uh, this is a different look at the character, and it basically asks the question, how would a character like this come to be? Many superhero and supervillain origin stories, I mean, everyone has to have, you have to have an origin story. It's a staple of comic book characters. I mean, everybody has an origin story. So, it's only natural to want to tell the origin story, I think, of the Joker. Of course, one of the running gags in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight was, of course, Joker had a different origin story for anybody who he would speak to. Now, what I think is interesting about this movie is they've taken the idea, the premise of what the Joker is. You know, he's a homicidal maniac. How does somebody become that way? And they've done my favorite thing. They've gone for peak verisimilitude. They wanted to ask this question and present a character, a comic book character, like the Joker, that is decidedly, from the first time we've seen him in the book, comic books, unrealistic. The way the Joker is portrayed has always been the clown prince of crime. However you want to look at how Joker has been uh, portrayed over the years, whether it was in the pages of comics or whether it was on movies or television, the Joker has never been ever presented as somebody who could possibly exist in our world. You could say that maybe Heath Ledger's Joker could be that way, but even then, even then, there was still a, a heightened, as realistic, I love the verisimilitude of the Christopher Nolan Batman films, but the character, they're still characters. And it looks to me, having not seen it, and by reading a lot of the reviews and the responses from people online and in the press, uh, that this is this is really a story of a man that could be alive now. I know it's a period piece. It takes place, I believe, in the early 80s. But the, the question that the film is asking is, what is it that 
can turn an ordinary man into a character like the Joker. First of all, I think it's very fertile ground to explore as a filmmaker, as an author, as an actor, as a director, however you want to couch it. I think great idea. And in telling this story, as with all great stories, any story actually that's told, there should be a kernel of human truth that everybody can recognize, all the viewers of this story. I mean, certainly viewers have different uh, intellectual acumen, so people can take different things away from it. But there's a lot of wackiness surrounding this movie, and I, I kind of wanted to get into that. I'm going to start out first and foremost, but I wanted to read I wanted to read an article that was in Deadline yesterday that Dade Hayes wrote. Uh, it was in Deadline yesterday. Joker director Todd Phillips is taken aback by violence rap. Isn't it rap like, uh, not like, hey, what's up? If that's a rap. Uh, My name is Boogie Knight, and yes, I'm a Capricorn. I like the fly girl who knows that they are. That's kind of a rap. Uh, Joker director Todd Phillips taken aback by violence rap. Isn't it a good thing to take away the cartoon element? Introducing Wednesday's New York Film Festival screening of Joker, director Todd Phillips acknowledged the strong reactions to the film, which finally opens commercially this weekend. There has been a lot said about the movie, a lot said by me too, I've learned, the director told the audience. I'm really excited that you're here and that we can finally let the movie speak for itself. After the screen, film screened at Tully Hall, Phillips, star Joaquin Phoenix, producer Emma tillinger Koskoff, production designer Mark Friedberg, and DP Lawrence Schur shared thoughts in a Q&A session. Phillips pushed back on criticism of Joker's depiction of violence. Some commentators have expressed anxiety over potential copycat behavior, with life, life imitating the film's spasms of mob violence unleashed by a loner with a gun, a potent setup in 2019. Phillips said the filmmakers had sought to strip away the usual layers of fantasy and exaggeration of the comic book genre and deliver a character study, albeit one of a homicidal sociopath. Their models were films like Mean Streets, Dog Day Afternoon, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he said. That's the surprising thing to me, Phillips said. I thought, isn't that a good thing to put real-world implications on violence? Isn't it a good thing to take away the cartoon element about violence that we've become so immune to? I was a little surprised when it turns into that direction, that it's irresponsible. Because to me, it's very responsible to make it feel real and make it have weight and implications. Very interesting. Uh, I... I completely am down with that portrayal. Um, You know, one of the things that I've been encountering my whole life is people have criticized the kind of entertainment I've chosen to enjoy. Whether it's comic books, I wasn't there for the seduction of the innocent, the whole Frederick Wordham thing where where comic books were, were, were called out as being a destroyer of youth, <clears throat> uh, EC comics in particular. But throughout my life, whether it's video games, whether it's horror novels, rock and roll music, movies themselves, such as A Clockwork Orange or horror films, slasher movies, whatever, there have always been people that are are saying that these things are the cause, that they themselves are dangerous because they cause people to do bad things. Heavy metal music, of course, gave rise to a whole generation of Satan worshipers who called up the Dark Lord even on a whim. Uh, No, they didn't. But some people would have you believe that they might have. And my, my, even when I was a kid, I remember there used to be, I, I used to listen to the CBS radio mystery theater that was on uh, it was on at 10.07 every weeknight. And I would listen to it when I went to bed when I was young. And I, I think I was like, I don't know, 13 or 14. And once I called in to a radio talk show that followed that at 11.07. And I defended A Clockwork Orange, I remember. It was right after I'd seen it. I was very full of myself and on my Kubrick kick. And I had my first VCR and was really going into 
full on film study mode. And I was watching anything and everything, anything that came out on pre-recorded video cassette, I was just devouring it all. And uh, Clockwork Orange literally changed my life, I think. It changed, it, it really had a profound impact on me. It was the first movie I ever watched twice, back to back. I literally watched it. I'd seen pictures of it in science fiction film books, and I'd heard about it my whole life, but I hadn't, there was no way for me to see it. It, sh it had never aired on television, to my knowledge. Uh, this was in the early 80s, and I finally was able to get it when the pre-recorded video cassette came out. And obviously, the first half an hour is full of horrible, horrific violence against, it's stylized, but it's still terrible. There's beatings, and there's rapes, and there's, there's just, there's just, it's not good. The movie fascinated me, and I, and I loved the film, and uh, I was blown away by it, and I watched it twice. And one of the things that I realized when I was watching this film is like with all Stanley Kubrick movies, he's always telling stories about the foibles of humankind. And his basic message is he's telling us, he's saying, I'm telling you all this story. I'm presenting you this story of human foible and folly in the hopes that you can take something from this tale and be better, be better, be better people that no, you're not supposed to emulate this behavior, this behavior, whether it was a lot of behavior in Lolita, whether it was Barry Lyndon, whether it was of course, Clockwork Orange, <laughs> uh, be better. And, and I think that the desire, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm speaking out of my ass of what Todd Phillips wanted to do, first of all, transform the comic book based film genre into something far more immediate and relevant and realistic that could speak to people that wouldn't necessarily watch a comic book based film. I know a lot of snobby people that comic book movies, whereas, I mean, the way Westerns are, the way cop movies are, the way lawyer movies are. I mean, I see them as all just extensions of, of usually there's, there's a good guy at the heart of these movies, sometimes maybe an anti-hero, but they're trying to do good things. They're trying to fight. I, I mean, what better way to tell the story of good versus evil than setting it in the milieu of, say, police? One of my favorite, I mean, I love police movies. I love cop thrillers. I love them. I've always loved them. I love lawyer dramas. One of my favorite cop thrillers is in, uh, internal Affairs with Andy Garcia and Richard Gere. Richard Gere plays a really, really bad, corrupt cop. And, you know, moving to L.A. in 1988, the, the gang divisions, the Rampart divisions, um, and, and Andy Garcia plays a good cop. And uh, I like those movies, but those movies are, they're not just about cops. They're using police as a, uh, as a metaphor. They might as well be knights of the round table. They go back all the way into antiquity. Any story where good is fighting evil, it just to make a story about good versus evil more palatable and interesting to watch, you make it about cops. Same with lawyers. You know, lawyers like Rusty Savage, uh, Harrison Ford's character, and Presumed Innocent. I love when, or or in Primal Gear, bring in Richard Gear. Richard Gear plays a bad cop in Internal Affairs, but in, it's actually called Primal Fear. I just say Primal Gear. When uh, Edward Norton plays a guy. Richard Gere has to uncover the truth. He's a lawyer. He does so. These are all proxies for good and evil. That's what those stories are about. Comic book films the same way. The Avengers, our police officers, our knights of the round table, our gunslingers in the Old West. It's all kind of the same thing. And it just depends what the fashion of the day is. That we, Who are our heroes? Are, the samurais are, are not kind of our, our our jam anymore cowboys we were used to be our jam they're not anymore now we have superheroes and in the case of joker the whole idea is don't be like arthur fleck you know have some understanding i mean we we are supposed to look maybe and learn from the movie having not seen it again that why not be compassionate why not understand why do we have to victimize each other when you don't know what someone what's going on in their lives. I mean, I keep I, I was beat up once in my life. Uh, I was walking down the street in Sydney, Australia. I've talked about this before. I was jumped by four guys as I talked on the phone to my then wife, and uh, they went clockwork orange on my ass. I had my nose broken. I had three crack ribs. I was a mess. 
I did, by the way, get up and fight. Note to self, note to any of you, if you ever get jumped or attacked by anyone, do not stay on the ground. You have to get up. You have to protect your face. Uh, you have to protect your eyes. You got to do it. You put your hands up in front of your face like this. You can stave off blows. Anyway, um, uh, I I was reasonably well adjusted when this happened, but there was a little PTSD involved. I was a little angry for a while, but th the fact is, hey, why not not do those things to people? You know, I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of of mob violence. It isn't good. It's not fun. And I think a movie like The Joker, uh, it, it, it's not saying it's not glorifying or romanticizing any of this. Um, and it's odd to me that that we that there's some narrative now. Well, I'm going to read another article. This article dropped today. It's by Alyssa Wilkinson. Uh, you can find her at Alyssa Marie or Alyssa, and it was on Vox. Now, when I pick these articles out, this is not my tacit approval of Vox as a media outlet. However, I did like this article. I thought it was really interesting because it's about fandom. The article is called, Joker Has Toxic Fans. Does that mean it shouldn't exist? And again, this is by Alyssa Wilkinson. I've been getting death threats, she writes. Not a lot of them, probably because I gave Joker a lukewarm score of 2.5 out of 5. Also, it's extremely un unlikely that any of these people have seen Joker since it doesn't open in theaters until October 4th. That hasn't kept fans from spiking the IMDb score as of Tuesday before release to 9.4 out of 10, with more than 17,000 votes, the majority of which have to be from people who couldn't have seen the movie yet. Rotten Tomatoes' audience score isn't available yet because the company uh, introduced a policy earlier this year that keeps audience scores from being logged until the movie opens. That prevents the kinds of coordinated review bombing efforts that movies like Black Panther and the all-woman Ghostbusters movie faced. The Joker isn't out yet, hasn't kept fans from sending threatening, often misogynistic tweets and emails, some vaguely warning of theater shootings, to some critics who have seen the movie but didn't praise it enough for their tastes. Receiving this kind of vitriol isn't entirely uncommon for film critics, particularly when we're writing about movies based on comic books or other properties with deep, allegiant fan bases. I got some particularly incoherent emails when I panned Bohemian Rhapsody last year. Before I or many of my colleagues had seen Joker at festivals a month ahead of its release, we were already cracking wary jokes stemming from well-worn gallows humor, knowing if we criticized the movie, no matter the reason, we'd be buried under angry emails from toxic fans. But the Joker threats seem different, or worse, like rancid icing on a moldy cake. Not only are they designed to provoke and intimidate, but they're supposedly defending a movie in which the protagonist, and one for whom we're at least meant to be, feel sorry for, if not sympathize with, fits the profile of many mass shooters. Lonely and deluded men who feel as though they've been rejected by society and pick up a gun to make a very public point. The Joker crowd has escalated the threats this time. The U.S. military newspaper Stars and Stripes reported more than a week ahead of the film's release that Army commanders at Fort Sill in Oklahoma had been put on notice about a credible threat. Disturbing and very specific chatter on the dark web, the article said, had tipped off a Texas law enforcement agency and the FBI to the possible targeting of a theater during Joker's October 4th release. Additionally, several in theater employees from various parts of the country who asked not to be named reported to me that security was being increased in advance of the film's release. Indeed, it was noted today that New York City cops are going undercover inside various screenings of the Joker. Some of the precaution has a historical basis. In 2012, a shooting before an Aurora, Colorado screening of The Dark Knight Rises left 12 dead and 70 wounded. After the shooting, rumors flew that the gunman had linked himself to the character The Joker. These rumors have since been debunked. In addition, the Joker character does not even appear in The Dark Knight Rises, and Joker is not meant to be related to any existing films set in Gotham City. 
Regardless, that tragedy, coupled with early reports of the film's plot having to do with violent criminals depicted in a sympathetic light, led families of the Aurora shooting victims to send a letter to Warner Brothers on Saturday or on September 24th, asking the studio to stand publicly against gun violence and donate to organizations that aid victims of gun violence. What the families didn't do, what no public figure has done, is call for Joker's release to be canceled though some critics wondered aloud if it would be better if it had never been made. And Warner Brothers made it clear in its statement <clears throat> it had no interest in doing so, unlike Universal Pictures, which reacted to right-wing outcry in August by canceling the release of a controversial film, The Hunt. Make no mistake, neither the fictional character Joker nor the film is an endorsement of real-world violence of any kind, the statement says. It's not the intention of the film, the filmmakers, or the studio to hold this character up as a hero. Uh, a second group includes, well, let me go back. All of the concern over the hunt came from its trailer, which is to say, from a movie nobody had seen, and thus pure speculation. But the responses to Joker have come from two different groups of people. The first includes the Aurora families and others who saw snippets of Joker and concluded that the movie would feature a sympathetic main character who matched many characteristics of mass killers, including actually killing people. And while some of those fears were justifiable and the concerns expressed in a reasonable manner, criticizing a movie based on hearsay or a trailer is dangerous and risks tipping into bad faith hysteria powered by partisanship. Probably none of this matters all that much, much for the film's box office draw, though threatening to shoot up a theater seems more likely to scare people away from seeing a movie than encourage them to go. But the Joker's most noxious fans are so committed to its success, so unable to bear the idea that anyone might degrade what they love sight unseen that they're willing to resort to sending sick threats to strangers. This one big wind-up set up what I'm about to say because I want to acknowledge a few things. First, people who lose loved ones in mass shootings, and there are so many in America today, deserve to be taken seriously. Second, the kind of threats around this movie match in a non-accidental way a message that could be taken away from the movie, that violence is the logical answer to feelings of loneliness and despair, no matter what Warner Brothers or the film's director, Todd Phillips, says. But third, the fight over Joker encapsulates two things. The importance of context when we talk about movies and the artist's responsibility when making potentially inflammatory art that could even be blamed for real-life violence. And then she goes on to write. First of all, I want to stop and I want to stop and say something about fandom here. We all take our fandom very personally. And a lot of us, especially now with the internet and, and the groups that we've formed within social media circles. Look, I've been going to conventions my whole life since I was a little kid. And I understand that fans, we hold what we love very dear. And we all think, actually, we all know the stuff that we like is an externalization of our own personalities. When we like Star Wars or we like Star Trek or we like comic books, you are a brony and you like My Little Pony, whatever the hell you like, you can't help but feel, especially the way we love these things that it is an extension of ourselves. I completely understand that. If you love something, Gilbert, why are you barking? There's nothing, please. When you love something, you want other people to love it too because you want them to also like you. Now, I've, I've known my whole life, I mean, my fandom, Gilbert, please. I don't know why Gilbert's, Gilbert's barking, but, but, um, I, I would like to think that I've been able to lead a pretty successful, very full life in addition to being a huge fan. Um, there was a letter that somebody wrote me about watching free enterprise. I, I didn't, I was thinking about sharing it, 
uh, but I felt that there's no way really around this issue. Gilbert! Sorry. Um, there's no way around this issue, but when I was making Free Enterprise, I was telling real stories that, even though I've been a genre fan my whole life, I've and I've been deeply, deeply into it, I also was very interested in other things. Real life, girls, politics. I had jobs. I played sports. Um, I was on the student government. I was the feature editor of my high school newspaper. I had a very rounded life. And, and you know, there are things I, I just don't get into. But, but um, you know, one of them I realized when we made Free Enterprise was having characters that were, let's just say, quite sexually active was something that the fan community was against. Because a lot of people turn to extreme interests or devout interest in fandom uh, to make up for perhaps the non-adventures they're having in their real lives. And I've always thought that it, it went hand in hand. The message from Star Trek is boldly go. Now, I'm not going to be going to any new planets anytime soon. So boldly go in your own life. And, and, and part of boldly going is to get out there and meet people and, and have experiences with members of the opposite sex and, and do all of those things. And one of the things that I, I didn't see growing up was I didn't, I, I never had to feel fear uh, from other fans. We were all fans of the same thing. We, we've loved everything together. And, and what was really interesting is even if somebody didn't like, like when I would go to conventions, I was seeing people, we were having conversations. And even I knew better if somebody liked something that I really hated, I just kept that to myself. So I, we could still have a nice conversation about the genre as a whole. Um, if you didn't like this thing, then maybe I find something else we liked. There was no anger and vitriol between people. Um, and and yet the fan community online, especially, I mean, we've seen, I've talked about it before, whether it was the rabid and sad puppies situation with the Hugos, whether it was things like Gamergate uh, and the things that went on there, <clears throat> whether it's love or hatred of The Last Jedi, Disney, Star Wars, there is a lot of vitriol that is, is permeating all fan cultures. The eighth season of, of Game of Thrones, and what's interesting is I used to like would watch things and I was quiet about whether I liked them or not. I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't like that as much as I wanted to, or I didn't think that was very good. Or I would watch something like when Joel Schumacher, when I went and saw Batman Forever. I mean, I liked Val Kilmer as Batman, but the rest of the movie, I'm like, what, what is this? Like, what, what am I, how am I supposed to take? I was confused. I'm like, why would somebody make this movie? You know? And and now, however, it's gotten to the point where we feel fans, certain fans feel the need to defend their favorite, defend a movie against what exactly? And I understand you can go to the IMDb and you can start, a, I guess, tell your friends to start a concerted effort on the IMDb to raise up the review. But that seems so strange to me. What does that have to do with you? What does the Joker... For you, for any individual, for any fan, a movie, a book, a video game, the only relationship that a fan needs to have with that thing is, is the relationship that they, they have with that thing. You know, if somebody else doesn't like something, it doesn't mean or it doesn't take away, I've said this before, how good something is or how good somebody else is doesn't make you any better or any worse. Uh, and the relationship that you have with something is your relationship. Nobody can take it away from you. And I, I find it strange that in fan circles now, there is this immediate, like, people, they they circle the wagons to defend a movie against public opinion? A movie that they haven't even seen? Now, I understand uh, the idea that a comic book movie can transcend the genre, that it, 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 can, um, it can become something greater than other comic book movies are, or the perception in the larger world finally... I know I have waited my whole life for somebody, I mean, with the uh, MCU and other movies with the amount of money they make, there's a credibility comic book movies had that they hadn't had ever before because there hadn't been very many of them. And I want to see science fiction, fantasy, horror uh, taken seriously. It was so great in my lifetime to see Lord of the Rings or Silence of the Lambs win Oscars because I felt, wow, 
uh, no longer uh, were certain genres seen as slumming of some kind. Like, oh, it's only a horror movie, or it's only a science fiction movie, or it's only a fantasy epic. They're, they're, they're not, it doesn't matter as much as, say, a movie like, oh, Sophie's Choice will always be more important than, say, Lord of the Rings. I never believed that growing up. So it's important to me when a movie like The Joker comes out that it's a serious look, potentially a serious look at how could a character like The Joker that I've been reading about literally since I've been alive come to actually exist in our world today? And I think that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And it legitimizes the idea of comic book characters in the first place. And that's what I think is really important about The Joker. And that we as fans should embrace the fact that somebody, a major motion picture studio and a director like Todd Phillips, has decided to treat a character with such reverence. Even though that character is a homicidal maniac, how did that character come to be? And in telling that story is telling a, a larger uh, a, a story of, of maybe having compassion. I mean, believe it or not, a movie that overtly is about, okay, violent violent insurrection brought about by a homicidal maniac and clown makeup, I mean, you could look at it that way. But like Stanley Kubrick's movies, he would present all kinds of human folly. But at the end of the day, I think Kubrick, who began as a documentary photographer when he was in his teens for Look Magazine, Stanley Kubrick loved humanity. He loved mankind. He loved all the craziness that went on within the human race. He loved human beings, but he also knew he was like, I'm, I'm telling these stories. So I hope that all of us can learn to be better people. And ultimately that's what I think movies like the Joker are, are look, I'm sure it's deliciously fun and depraved and uh, difficult to watch. And it's going to make you think and all that. But at the end of the day, what this movie is saying, ultimately, I think, again, haven't seen it, don't know how well it's doing this, but based on the people who have seen it, reading these articles, I think ultimately the uh, answer is just be more mindful of your fellow man. People can be in real pain, and you don't know. You don't know who you encounter and where they're at in their lives, but perhaps it might be better just to be nice to somebody than not. But anyway, I want to continue um, to go on uh, with this article. My experience with all of this is colored by the first 10 years of my career in which I wrote for a predominantly Christian audience at a Christian publication. The way conservative Christian publications do film criticism is usually tied more to content issues than to the movie as a whole. In other words, a movie is objectionable if the characters use profanity or have sex, no matter the context. Interestingly, conservative Christian audiences seem to have a better sense of context when it comes to violence than sex or profanity. After all, The Passion of the Christ, a gory, intensely violent film, remains the top R-rated film at the domestic box office 15 years after its release, largely because church groups turned out en masse. And movies like Hacksaw Ridge, Braveheart, and Saving Private Ryan have done well with Christian audiences. Their violence is related to patriotism and heroism, unlike, for instance, the Saw films. But in general, content over context is the rule in that world. I often felt as though I were fighting an uphill battle in advocating that we read a movie as a whole rather than react to isolated bits of it as if every instance of offensive content caused the same level of offense. Interestingly, Todd Phillips tried to draw on this kind of reasoning in offering a defense of his film. Speaking to the Associated Press, he compared the violence in Joker to the violence in the John Wick movies, which star Keanu Reeves, which stars Keanu Reeves as a former assassin who's dragged back into the business when some mobsters kill his puppy. He's a white male who kills 300 people and everybody's laughing and hooting and hollering, Phillips said of John Wick. Why does this movie get held to different standards? It honestly doesn't make sense to me. Leaving aside how Phillips' characterization of Wick is slightly wrong, Reeves' ancestry includes Chinese and Hawaiian parentage and he identifies as a person of color, the defense is still disingenuous. 
The John Wick movie's stylized violence has its roots in martial arts and revenge genres, and the series is at pains to establish an internal system of morality as well as Wick's anguished love for his departed dog and his dead wife who gave the dog to him as his motive. By contrast, Joker is a movie about a man who's convinced that society has gone entirely mad, who explicitly believes in nothing and has no moral code, and who becomes a folk hero for turning to violence as a result. The way the movie is structured and shot strongly suggests he may be the only sane one in a crazy world. These aren't the same things at all. The violence in both Joker and John Wick is expressed differently, shot differently and couched in different situations and moral universes. In art, what matters is not just the words you say, but how you say them. The issue is not what art's about, it's how it's about it. Saying the uproar over Joker is about violence is a deflection. The worry isn't that some people will see some guns in this one movie and suddenly be inspired to commit crimes. It's that the manner in which the Joker's actions are depicted will encourage copycat violence from people who see him as a hero. But in comparing Joker and John Wick, I think Phillips is trying clumsily to get at one big question. Do artists and their art bear any responsibility for what happens next? once their art is in the world. To put it another way, when Warner Brothers says that the movie isn't supposed to be an endorsement of real-world violence of any kind and that nobody intends to hold this character up as a hero, does that settle how the film should be received? Obviously not. Artists don't get to determine the final meaning of their art. Once it's out in the world, it takes on a life of its own. Everyone's got an interpretation. Everyone takes something different away from a movie. Just the spectrum of critical reactions to Joker confirms this fact. For some, at least those acting in good faith, that's the same concern that came up with The Hunt, even though it was impossible to judge whether those concerns were valid since nobody had seen the full film. There's no evidence that violent movies cause violent actions. But while art doesn't tell us what to do, it does shape how we imagine the world. It gives us images and narratives by which to justify our choices and live our lives. It confirms our desires and tells us how to go about getting what we want. It gives us permission to live a certain way by showing us what it looks like to live that way. When I got beat up, I was walking home late at night. I was blocks away from my apartment. I could see it, William Street in Sydney, going up to the cross. The footy was on, rugby. I'd gotten out, a lot of fans on Australia, you know, big drinkers. These kids were drunk. Uh, do I think that drinking and rugby was the reason that four people decide to, decide to just jump me and beat the heck out of me? No. Would I ever say that, oh, we should ban alcohol and get rid of the rugby because the combination of the two caused these people to get their blood up and uh, that's why they attacked not just me, but uh, – a German tourist, and another couple. No. The, the responsibility is not the rugby, nor it was the liquor, nor it was the bar that was serving a liquor. The responsibility lies in those four individuals that decided to go off on a tear and attack people. That's it. At least that's the way I see it. I'm not going to blame rugby or beer for causing people to become, well, assholes, and nor should a movie be ever ever should a movie be considered, oh, an instigator for this kind of behavior. That is an excuse. That is an excuse. That is an easy excuse that people can use to say, okay, the reason that these people, that these lonely shut-ins or people that are identifying whether they're incels or not, uh, that they found one another and they're using this as an anthem, the way Elliot Roger has been used as an anthem, to go out and commit violence of any kind to make themselves feel better or to go down in some kind of incel history book as a hero, this is not the fault of the Joker. The responsibility remains with the human beings that choose to act this way. 
So I think it is unfortunately very likely that someone could attempt, this is me uh, reading the article, could attempt an act of violence and claim it was inspired by the Joker. Most likely this person won't be someone who previously had no violent impulses and developed them because of the Joker. It seems much more likely that Joker will simply have furnished an excuse, a handy pop culture reference to pin blame on or explain away an unspeakable action. If, God forbid, that were to occur, neither Todd Phillips nor Warner Brothers could take it back by saying they didn't intend for it to happen. Yet it's not Todd Phillips' fault or the movies if violent occur violence occurs. It's a strange kind of not-quite-responsibility to bear, but it's one that artists have to bear regardless. Charles Manson claimed to have been inspired by the Beatles' White Album to order his followers to conduct brutal murders, but that's not the Beatles' fault. The Catcher in the Rye has been linked, albeit tenuously, to a number of murders, but that's not J.D. Salinger's fault. The worst fans of Breaking Bad saw Walter White's destructive and egomaniacal path as heroic, but that's a misreading of the text. They saw what they wanted to see. We can't fall into the trap of using the worst fans of a work of art to throw out or invalidate that work of art. But neither can we say the work of art is above criticism just because its creator wants to shrug off responsibility. I personally never suggest Joker was intended to incite violence, but it portrays its main character with sympathy and his actions as a reasonably logical conclusion to his circumstances. The violence isn't the problem. The filmmaking has failed to do what it wanted to do, avoid valorizing violence. So it's not great art. And if Joker engenders sympathy for the devil, so to speak, then it's well within critics and audiences' rights to call it out and decry its moral bankruptcy if they think that's bad. Intentions matter, but only to a point. All of this can't and shouldn't dissuade artists from trying to understand the world through making art, whether it's a movie or a book or a painting or anything else. Hollywood has engaged in a long history of self-censorship but that often came with dire consequences that hampered artists from the great work they could have produced. So, still, a work of art has to be able to stand up to critique or at least endure some blows, however. Much the artist might disagree. It's right and good for critics and audiences to lodge some complaints and arguments against a work of art. Acting as a place for us to argue and rethink our lives and commitments is one thing that art is made for and what it does best. That's what gives art life. That's what gives life vitality. I think the people making death threats against critics or audiences are getting what they want. The feeling of being powerful, the enjoyment of making other people live in fear. It's the same evil and cowardly impulse that drives abusers and tyrants. It's the same chaos the Joker character in other tellings is trying to sow. Not fear of any one thing in particular, but a general sense that nothing makes sense and every part of life is dangerous. In a broken world, this is the gamble we make when we're creating art or experiencing it. Safe art is usually bad. Then again, not all unsafe art is good art. But if the meaning making ends, when the artist releases the work into the world, then it's dead on arrival. The best thing that can happen for, from a movie like Joker is we vigorously fight over it, learn from its flaws and its successes, and walk away with something for next time. I love this article, and I wanted to read it because I totally agree. I totally agree that good art, great art, is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And... Uh, I just I thought this was really worth sharing, and I wanted to to share it with you. What do you guys think? Let's see what you guys are thinking today um, for Joker Day. Stephen Foley is here. Uh, uh, actually, he was here yesterday, but I'm going to read this anyway because he uh, it, he sent this chat to me yesterday. I already read it, but I'm going to read it again because it was the first thing I saw. Rob, I love your open mindedness that we don't often agree politically, but we love the same movies, and we need to be able to talk and speak with each other. Again, Stephen, that's my desire to do these chats. I think that the greatest thing that we can have about life is communication between one another. It's the only way we can sort of share our experiences of what's life all about. How can we make it better? 
I, I think that that I've always believed that the one thing that human beings are wanting to do, no matter what, where you come from, where you live, we all want to make our lives better. We want to make our lives and, and the lives of our friends, our loved ones, our family better. That's what we're doing. Movies certainly are about. Movies help you pass the time. Movies bring delight. Um, that's what movies are all about. Not only are movies detailing the human experience, but they're supposed to at some level, even like I take joy from the most horrific horror films, but I still like them. You know, I, 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 The Exorcist, even though I think it's probably the scariest movie ever made, my favorite horror film, uh, brings me delight when I watch it. I find it delightful. I, you know, uh, I got a box set, this new Arrow box set of the films of Mario Bava. I'm a big Mario Bava fan. They they put the, put out this this box of of it, the macabre visions, macabre visions, a box of macabre visions from Mario Bava. That's supposed to bring you joy, but I think that's what we want to do through communication, through sharing, through telling stories. And let's face it, we're always telling each other stories. You'll never believe what happened to me today. I mean, the reason you're conveying a story is because you know that we will, whoever you're telling the story to, will have something to say about it. And I think that's that's important. Uh, that's what life's about, man. Storytelling. J.B. Bonifacio says, got my Joker ticks for Friday. In the event I end up loving the film, I will self-cancel as per directed by Twitter. <laughs> I, I just don't understand. I mean, wouldn't you love something? I, I, what's... Uh, don't we all want to love the Joker? I, I can't wait to see the approach. I, I really am very excited. And I know uh, in just a little over two hours, I'm going to be seeing the Joker. Uh, James Lockman. J James. James sent, sent, sent. Wow, what a generous super chat, James. <laughs> James, of course, uh, is in Honolulu. And he sent in some chats to the John Campius show this morning. And he's sending me one. So, James, wow, thank you very much. Aloha, Rob. Bruh, I could not forget about you. Popcorn and drinks on me. I just received my Hot Toys Darth Maul on his Sith speeder, and it's awesome. I have the Darth Maul premium format figure and just ordered the display case from Mod Case and Sideshow. Well, James, you are a man of impeccable taste. Uh, you know what, James? First of all, that's very generous of you. But second of all, you've now allowed me to wax rhapsodic about Hot Toys once again. Uh, as many people know, at the New York Comic Con, they unveiled the IG-11 droid. That's, of course, Taika Waititi's character, which looks like IG-88, but a little different. And the Mandalorian hot toy figures from the Mandalorian. But what James is referring to is Hot Toys has a premium line of their figures, the DX figures. And they've made DX Jokers. I have, actually, you can see behind me. I, I don't, actually can't because I've never lit it up. But there is, uh, there's DX Joker figures of Jack Nicholson back there and Heath Ledger. But there, it's their premium line, and they recently released a DX Darth Maul figure with two different head sculpts. And if you get the the deluxe version, it comes with his Sith speeder from the Phantom Menace. It is an incredible, incredible figure, and it's got Maul's lightsaber and it even what the hot toys has started doing is they even make blades for their lightsabers that are blurry. So they look like they're in motion. So when you do an action pose with Maul or whatever, uh, it's even more action packed. So James in Honolulu, not only can he go drive to the North shore and, and surf some big waves, he can go home and he can play with his Darth Maul on a Sith speeder and the premium format mat figures are quarter scale figures, which are, Sideshow quarter scale figures are, are beautiful. They're things to behold and they're fantastic. So James, uh, let me give you one. You and I, sir, we park our shuttle crafts in the same shuttle bay. And thank you so much for that generous super chat supporting the channel. And I'll do that. I, I, you know what? I'm going to buy Elizabeth popcorn and drinks uh, and I'll tell her it's on you. So thanks very much. And uh, I'm glad you got your hot toys mall. Uh, do you have any other Hot Toys figures coming? Uh, what are you paying off? Or are you just buying them all at once? Uh, you know, I've started, I've discovered the joys of, of financing Hot Toys figures <laughs> over the course of time. Either that or you sell an old Hot Toys figure to buy the latest iteration. I think I might have to do that with my Falcon, actually. I have the first release of the Falcon. I've always wanted to have the Avengers release of the Falcon. 
I don't have the Falcon. I don't have Sam uh, in his Avengers garb. I need the more traditional white and red coloring, not like the original paramilitary Falcon that I have right behind me. Daniel McBreen. Wow, Daniel, thank you. Hey, Rob, just want to say thanks for being awesome. I'll try and support the channel in any way I can. I just watched John Wick 3 again, and I thought it was great. If you don't mind, can you share your thoughts on the movie? You know what? I'm going to tell you something. John Wick 1 is still my favorite of the John Wick films. Uh, I really liked John Wick 2, but I felt, again, it got a little repetitive. John Wick 1 had the propulsive story. And you were getting into that world and you were discovering, like even the people that came to clean up the mess in John Wick's house. It was interesting. David Patrick Kelly showing up. Um, so I love John Wick. John Wick 2 was beautiful. We got to see a lot more of the world, meet more characters. But John Wick 3, I really liked John Wick 3, but I thought the end, when you get back into the Continental, the end was sort of interminable. It nothing new happened. It was just fight after fight after fight after fight, and it was fine. But after I've seen movies like my beloved The Raid, and of course the or as I like to say, the Rad and the Rad Two Barrendal, um, I, I just think that the John the action in the John Wick franchise is ultimately the franchise over the course of the movies. It gets a little repetitive, and what the John Wick franchise has going for it is adding to this mythology, and. Part two added to the mythology and John Wick three, you know, when they went overseas, there was a lot of mythology and world building there that I thought was great. And I was really, I loved John Wick three until the end. And I still, I still liked it a lot. I still really enjoyed John Wick three, but I thought the ending was a bit more repetitive because we didn't learn anything new. We knew uh, until, well, I'm not, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it, 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 it just seemed that the, the, the end fight was a little repetitive for me and i wanted more from it. it it the first half i thought was well the first three quarters probably the first two thirds thought was pretty stellar enjoyed it a lot but um yeah it kind of in a way uh i was hoping it would be a little bit more a little bit more um here's another letter from dean mikitich See, I got it right that time, didn't I, Dean? Dean Mikitich. Uh, this is another article that I thought was uh, interesting. Well, it's not an article, but another letter, but I thought it worth sharing. Hi, Rob, and the Post Geek Singularity. Today, I read an article that could mean some hope for our beloved franchises. We talked a little bit about this on the, on the John Campy show, but I wanted to share this. Today, I read an article that could mean some hope for our beloved franchises where we no longer have to put up with bad sequels, prequels, and reboots. And the rights for them come out of the hands of the big corporations like Disney and Viacom. An article was written about copyright and how the studios could lose their franchises like Die Hard, Predator, Alien, Lethal Weapon, and so many others. How so, I hear you ask? It all has to do with the Copyright Act of 1976. This enabled songwriters to get back the rights to their songs after 35 years from the record labels. Obviously, this would mean that if you wrote, say, a classic rock song that's very popular, the Eagles Hotel California, after 35 years, they could get it back. The songwriters could get the rights back to the song. They would own it. The record companies would not. Their publishing company would, would not. They would. In 2003, the law was changed to include authors and screenwriters, and they have started to use this. According to The Hollywood Reporter, a barrage of legal proceedings by novelists and screenwriters are looking to claim back the copyrights to their work, and this is taking Hollywood by storm. Gary K. Wolf, who wrote Who Censored Roger Rabbit, which the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit was based on, is taking this new rights up. Along with the estate of the late Roderick Thorpe, whose book Nothing Lasts Forever was turned into Die Hard, is now taking measures to secure the rights from Fox. Other than that, uh, people also doing this are Michael McDowell for Beetlejuice and Gail Ann Hurd, who co-wrote the screenplay for Terminator. 
Unfortunately, this does not apply to Star Trek or Star Wars, as the primary stipulations of the Copyright Act require that the license to the work have been granted on or after January 1st, 1978, and that 35 years have passed since publication under the grant. As both came out before this date, Lucas and Roddenberry are unable to claim back their rights. Though I don't know the in and outs of the sale of Star Wars to Disney, I would think that Lucas sold Lucas Films to them as that company holds the rights to Star Wars. If this is the case and the stipulations of the Copyright Act started in, let's say, 1970 instead of 78, then Lucas could claim back the rights to Star Wars from Disney, which would be a major blow for them as they bought Lucas Film to get the rights for Star Wars. Alas, that is not the case unless someone get that part of the Copyright Act changed, though Lucas could do it for Indiana Jones if he wanted. I would assume that when Lucas made this sale, it was there was in the contracts, they would take care of all this. They're like, nope, there's no reversion clause. You cannot come after the rights. You agree in the contract that this sale is final. For screenwriters, this law only applies if they were not hired to write. In other words, the studio did not hire them to write a script for a film or TV show. So any screenwriter that was hired by a studio to write or rewrite a script will not be able to claim it. They can only claim it if they wrote the story and sold it to a studio to be made. That's what Shane Black did for the original Lethal Weapon. He created the characters of Riggs and Murtaugh. It was an original script that the studios purchased from him. That would be a spec script. So uh, what Dean Mikitich is saying here, and he writes, he's correct. If you're hired, if it's a work for hire job, if the studio says, hey, we want you to write this, then you'd have no claim. You have to have originated the work yourself. You would have to be the author of the work that was either then purchased or an agreement was made with the studio. But those rights would revert to you if you created the underlying property. If it includes the rights, oh, so uh, um, let's see. How this works with films themselves is not the rights to the stories, I'm not sure. Would the studio still own them as they made it and therefore be able to carry on distributing and making money from the sales but are unable to make any more films in a franchise they not, no longer hold the rights to? Yes. Do the authors and screenwriters own the rights to the films as well? No. They don't because there was a deal made. What happens is the underlying rights to the property would revert back. Like if you wanted to make a Die Hard sequel, you would have to go to the estate of Roderick Thorpe, who now owns the copyright. They've the, the copyright is returned to him. So a studio would have to make another deal. It would just have to be another rights deal. And, and then they could make another Die Hard movie. Or another studio could go and buy the underlying rights. Now the original studio, Fox, is always going to own the Die Hard movies. They paid for the privilege of doing so, but then the rights would be up for grabs. Anybody could go buy the underlying rights for to make a Die Hard movie. Fox would have to renegotiate. It would be like they're starting all over. And I think that's great. If it includes the rights to films as well, I'm sorry to say, Rob, you got to wait another 15 years to get Free Enterprise back for free. <laughs> So how can this be good for our beloved franchise as well? If they are back with the people that created them, then studios would have to stop putting out sequels, prequels, and reboots that don't live up to the originals, just so they can make a quick buck from an established franchise. The last few Die Hard films, remakes of Robocop, Total Recall, etc. With the franchise rights being back with the creators, if they wanted to make more in their franchise, it more than likely would have to be done with the care and attention that franchise deserves. Dean Mikitich. Uh, Dean, that's very interesting. Uh, I want to thank you for writing in. Yeah, we were talking about that. It's very interesting. This copyright, the idea of that is very interesting. We'll see where that, in fact, goes. Because I don't know where it's going to go. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. And as many people know, I touched upon this in John Campion's show today, that you know, the copyright acts have been utilized and maybe misinterpreted or interpreted differently by companies like Disney that want to retain, of course, they don't want to give up Mickey Mouse and they don't want Mickey Mouse to fall into the public domain, which how long can something stay out of the public domain? Very good question. Dan V900 says, have you read The Dark Knight, a true Batman story by Paul Dini? It's great about his experience with being mugged and almost killed. He had PTSD and the details of how he coped while continuing to 
work? Uh, no, I have not. And I, you know, I have to tell you, uh, that was an interesting experience. I mean, to be honest, it, it was, um, you know, you're not to have violence perpetrated against your body in any way, shape, or form is really not something that you expect, especially in your daily life. You don't expect that literally I was walking home. I mean, yeah, it was at night, but it was a street that I'd walked many times. I didn't feel unsafe. And these kids, I was walking up the street and they were walking down toward me and I was sucker punched, uh, uh, sucker kicked actually in the head. And it was, at first you're like, you don't quite know what's going on. Then they were on me. I was wearing a, a big leather jacket and I did fall on the ground. I, I, um, and they were, you know, they were kicking in my ribs and it was, it was, there was, there was no rhyme or reason to it, but, um, you know, you get up and I, I got up and I tried to throw a few punches, but I, you know, I was so stunned. I didn't know what was happening. There was blood in one of my eyes. I couldn't see. And, but eventually they ran off. They ran off basically because I started talking. I was using my voice to project. And I was, I was like, get the fuck. I was saying things. And they finally, they finally left because that was, that was the one tool I had. And what was really interesting about it is I, I've, I think I've told this recently before on this, on this chat, but I wasn't aware of how bad I was hurt. And I didn't realize that my nose was, I mean, blood, it was like somebody turned on a tap. There was just blood flowing out of my face and my nose and just, it was just so, and I walked into um, the, my building where I lived, my apartment that I was renting in Sydney. And there's, you know, a concierge, big guy. And he'd seen me come home partying and wrecked many times, but he'd never seen this. And, you know, I'm, I didn't really know what was going on. I just figured, you know, shine it on. Um, and I collapsed. I was concussed. I didn't realize that. And I just collapsed in the middle of the floor. And I woke up 18 hours later in bed. Adam Robitel, who uh, directed Escape Room, who I was working with, and he directed uh, Insidious 4 and the, the Haunting of Deborah Logan, or The Taking of Deborah Logan, uh, he woke me up in my bed because he lived down the hall. And, and I was, there was blood everywhere. It was crazy. But you do, you, 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 there was an anger that I was living with. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go to therapy or anything. So I was working on Superman Returns. I was still having a great time. And my attitude was what sort of got me through. But there are times when I was in pain and I was taking, it was the only time I had ever, ever taken still to this day, like things like Vicodin. I've never taken anything like that before. And, and it was, you know, I felt angry for a long time because you wanted, you, you, you keep flashing back to those, it was very, it, nothing like that's ever happened to me before, but I totally, it made me totally understand PTSD because, you know, it took a while to heal. My nose is never, I, I guess I could get plastic surgery or something and have it, have it, have some rhinoplasty done where I'm, you know, my nose gets fixed. But yeah, it's, it's it, because it's such a needless thing. You know, you wonder like, what did I do? Like, why would these people do something like this to me? I'm sure you know, that's what humanity has been asking themselves throughout human history. Why did, why have my fellow mankind victimized me in this way? But yeah, I'd be interested. I didn't know that he wrote that book. Um, <laughs> Electric Barbarella 27 says, I'll buy your paramilitary Falcon. <laughs> well, you know what? I would sell it to you. Uh, uh, I, you can't really, can you, you, I don't know if you can see it, but you can kind of see it. He's, he's here. He's on a stand. He's above, he's flying above the, the adventures. But that's you know what, I mean that's how you, that's how it's done. You you know contact me or or if you really want it, we can make, we can do a deal because I'll just I'll buy I'll buy the new one with with what I'd sell that one for. It's in mint condition. I mean other than that, I've got the box. It's in it's it's great. It's a great figure. So uh, it's in mint condition. <laughs> Anthony Gonzalez says now I love both RoboCop and The Crow, but I think they're in a sense the same movie. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know if I, I can see why you, you think that I can see why you think that, because of course, in both of those movies, essentially a man, you know, um, uh, uh, Paul Verhoeven's talked about how Robocop is a crucifixion story that Murphy, um, he gets, he gets crucified by those villains. I mean, not literally, but his being gunned down that way. And Eric Draven, of course, same kind of thing. His, his house is broken into and he's thrown out a window and murdered. Um, and I, it both are about re the resurrection of characters and, and all of that. Um, and they kind of, I mean, I can see that, but you could say that about, you know, there's a lot of movies that, that are 
in one hand, RoboCop is, is resurrected with technology and Eric Draven in The Crow is resurrected by supernatural power or love, however you want to choose to look at it, which could be just a supernatural power. Um, and yeah, I think they're similar. I, I, I think they are similar, but but I think the milieus make them radically different. There's there is the constant raining and the the city and 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 um and the 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 fact that it takes place right before Halloween and there's something spooky and there's uh the crow is a much more darkly romantic movie as I've often said it's the goth you know it's, it's <laughs> what did I say what did I I said it's the goth the the the, the way that Bella Lugosi's dead is sort of the goth stairway to heaven. The Crow is is like the goth gone with the wind. It's the ultimate goth movie. And RoboCop is, it's there's a lot more satire going on. I think The Crow is more earnest. You know, it can't rain all the time. The Thackeray quote, "Mother is the name of God on all on the lips of all children." I mean, it's such. There's just there's so much more romance and 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 it's the the, the feelings and the milieu of the movies are different. And I think it adds more to the difference. Uh, of the films themselves, but it's a good observation. I think you're spot on that they're basically uh, very much the same kind of movie. Uh, Ian Samuels is here. Ian Samuels has a quick letter uh, about James Bond. Ian Samuels says, with so many franchises that have been rebooted or reimagined with varying degrees of success, why has James Bond been more of the same? James Bond is worthy of an update, reboot, or reimagining. With that in mind, what about this? An SAS commander who served as part of Task Force Black in Iraq, hunting down members of the Al-Qaeda leadership, becomes disgruntled with how much influence and, in his view, interference politicians are having on military decisions, leaves the SAS and becomes a mercenary for hire, but is convinced to return to work for British intelligence. He agrees to this if he is allowed to create his own task force that will not carry out missions, but that his task force will be recognized as both top secret and not beholden to any government. Free to take on missions from any government around the world. He names his top secret task force Bond, each member of which is known by only their first name and the task force name, the leader being James Bond. What do you think? I think that's cool. But, but you know, here, here's the thing about James Bond. And while Elizabeth just came home, and that's, that's, uh, that's Tallulah being excited to see people. Um, remember, James Bond is a literary character based on the novels of Ian Fleming. And, you know, to you could reimagine Bond in the way you suggest. I think actually it's quite quite a, a, a legitimate way to modernize the character. But I think the problem is that you still are ultimately stuck with what Ian Fleming wrote. And that reimagining of a character, I would say, that's a really interesting idea. Why not make that new idea that you have the basis of a movie series starring Idris Elba? You know, I mean, everyone's like, well, we're going to have a black James Bond. You know, I, I why not just create a new character? I love this idea. This is a great idea. You should write this book, Ian. I mean, write up this exactly the way you wrote it. Doesn't have to be Bond. Everyone's going to know you're doing a riff on what a modern Bond could be. As a matter of fact, when you're being when this becomes a best selling series that you now sell to somebody to make the movies, you'll get to say in interviews, you'll be like, you know what? I was thinking about how Bond could be reimagined, and I thought. Why bother when I can write my own series, create a new character that Idris Elba can now play? And, uh, um, but I think you're spot on, but it's just that, you know, characters like Bond were characters of their time. And I think that not all characters of their time should necessarily be reinvented for the modern age. I think it's okay that the Bond franchise can be, well, steeped in where, where it came from. I, I honestly think that maybe James Bond, I wouldn't be surprised if the Broccoli's, if Barbara Broccoli, well, and Michael Wilson, if they sell the James Bond rights after the 25th Bond film. The movies are very difficult to make. They've made 25 Bond films that now span um, 57 years and give it to someone else. You know, how long are you going to continue? How much money do you need to have in your life? I mean, they've been doing very, very well. The last Bond films, the entire Craig run has been very successful. And um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine. I, I could see them hanging it up and selling it off to someone else. But I like your idea. I think your idea is great. I, you should write that yourself. You're an author. Write that book. I mean, I, I would definitely read read that. Uh, Brian Eng 
writes in. He says, what type of radio station would you like to DJ at? Okay. There's only one radio station I would DJ at. That would be an 80s radio station. As long as I could play remixes, B-sides, deal with 80s music, you know, that, that would be it. I'd have to be DJing at, a, at an 80s, maybe not an 80s radio station, but if I could have an 80s show, I would love to have an 80s pop culture show and just talk about my growing up with, with the, the 80s were the best time to, I think, for pop culture because all of it was so intertwined. Music, fashion, uh, movies, novels, all of it was all, all of pop culture was all very intertwined. If you loved Duran Duran, you loved Patrick Nagel's artwork. In turn, you liked the kind of clothes Patrick Nagel's models wore. I mean, it was all, it was all part of the same continuum. And uh, I would love to do deal with all of that. Deal with all the pop culture of the 80s. I think it'd be great. So that's a good question. Uh, but definitely in 80s, whether it was a station or uh, an 80s channel of some kind. I mean, count me in. So I think it'd be great. I'm in. Um, now I'm all excited. I want to become an 80s DJ. <laughs> Um, a uh, factual opinion uh, asks my thoughts on the TNG episode, The Outcast. Uh, this is interesting. So, the TNG episode, The Outcast, and the the person who wrote the episode, I, I need to find out who wrote this episode because this is, I think, this is a very important episode of TNG. Um, uh, let's see. I gotta, I gotta put put this. Uh, uh tng so for those of you who don't know what the episode of the outcast is right off the bat the enterprise rolls up to a genderless society and um riker falls in love with a character named soren not to be confused with malcolm mcdowell's character from generations so riker actually falls in love with this genderless a person from this genderless race and the person he falls in love with is having fe feelings that this person wants to be a female. And in this genderless society, there are no ma males and there are no females. And so to have female feelings, not good for this society. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to spoil it. She basically undergoes treatment where her feelings of wanting to be a woman and indeed the romance she had been carrying on or or they, I guess, had been carrying on, on with Riker, uh, is wiped away. And the ending is rather chilling because it touches on um, uh, things like a boy erased, that kind of therapy where you can have gay conversion therapy. And now a lot of people criticize the episode because the people of this genderless society, especially the, the actress that played Soren, um, who is uh let's see Melinda uh, Melinda Coolia uh, who played Soren is a woman so there's a lot of people and I've always heard this criticism especially from people of the LGBTQ community that it didn't go far enough at the time that if they really wanted to make a statement they would have cast a male actor to play Soren well I agree with that I think it's true but at the time at the time and where people were at, I thought that was a very audacious episode of Star Trek to deal with. Now, of course, it would not nearly be woke enough. But back, you know, uh, back in the day, uh, that episode, I think, is one of the finest episodes of Next Generations from season five. And it is a, I think, a terrific episode. And it's one of Star Trek's earliest efforts at dealing with, well, same sex or, or, non-gender or couplings that aren't and it was it was i thought a great episode and it, it ended in a chilling manner where where soren was literally reprogrammed she was well she wanted to be a she and she was forced back by their society which wasn't open enough to this they it was something that was going on a lot more than they wanted to admit and she underwent this conversion therapy to make her head right. And it's it's a chilling, chilling episode. And it is is definitely one of 
if not the first time that Star Trek directly addressed these issues. And it did it in a science fiction action adventure context, the way all great Star Trek worked. I mean, the way 60s episodes of Star Trek, like A Private Little War that I've talked about, dealt with Vietnam. This was one of the first ways that Star Trek was dealing with same-sex issues, LGBTQ issues, in the context of a science fiction fantasy show. Um, so I, I thought it was I thought it was great. I mean, I, I really think it's great. However, I do recognize that there are many people that don't think it goes far enough, and I've actually heard uh, friends of mine uh, that are gay talk about how awful the episode is. So perhaps I'm not quite the best person to look upon it. Uh, I thought it was good for what it did at the time, but that not might not be true today. Um, <laughs> Willow Yang says... I, for one, am really looking forward to the possibility of seeing Dame Helen Mirren and Sir Ian McKellen get it on in The Good Liar. Uh, Willow Yang, I love the fact that you are unabashed, you have unabashed enthusiasm for all human forms of sexuality. I think it's great. And I, too, uh, Dame Helen Mirren and, and Ian McKellen, I mean, if they're going to hook up, even Helen Mirren now, she's in her 70s, she is still a hottie. Uh, so is Ian McKellen, for that matter. Even though, of course, um, I don't know about Ian McKellen's character in the film. I, I, I don't know how far his swindling ways go. I'm really looking forward to seeing this. For those of you who don't know, Bill Condon's new movie, The, Bill Lo the, 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 the Good Liar, the new trailer dropped today. Watch it. It looks awesome. It looks like two powerhouse actors are going at it. Height of their powers. Uh, I really can't wait to see it. Um, Emil Johansson. Uh, he's here. He says, no spoilers. The Joker was ballsy. I'm in shock. Well, I'm I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, it is, after all, a Joker day. So the fact that we're getting like, uh, I, I mean, how excited are we all? I, I'm, I'm pretty damn excited, I have to say. So uh, that's good. I mean, I guess because you're in Europe, aren't you? Uh, you were able to see it. And I know it's open other places in the world early. I'm very excited to see it today. Uh, my last letter today, that doesn't mean I'm going to end this chat right away, but Paul in Long Beach, my man Paul in Long Beach, who is a funny guy. Like he is like Joe Pesci. He's funny like he makes me laugh. Uh, happy belated New Year, Rob. Shana Tava, and may the Schwartz always be with you, my friend. What an excursion to the East Coast I've had. Last Saturday, a wedding. Sunday, a family barbecue. Then on Monday, I went to my corporate offices for the first time in almost three years. My boss even brought me in my favorite New York City cupcakes. Monday evening, I saw Ed Astra at the AMC Empire on 42nd Street. As such, I'd like to thank Joshua L., M.E., and Fen War for keeping NYC weird. Kudos, connoisseurs. Did you guys, get, like, hook up together? Did you guys, like, have dinner? I mean, not. I don't mean hook up, hook up. I mean, like, get a meal or something. Regarding Tuesday's show, woke culture, rampant PCism, and free speech, there is a consistent misinterpretation of the First Amendment and the protections of free speech in America. Americans sometimes have no clue about the laws, and I would prefer not to confuse your international viewers who may not quite understand the nuances of our Constitution. So let's read the First Amendment together really quickly. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Was that too fast? You said read it fast really quickly. Congress, I'm going to slow it down. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Utilizing the actual legal interpretation, I can only think of one person in America whom has been canceled for the exercise of free speech. Colin Kaepernick, formerly the, the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. The POTUS threatened the NFL, and the NFL blackballed him, plain and simple. 
This isn't to denigrate the instances of cultural of cancel culture that we've discussed here, nor is it an indictment of Todd Phillips' recent comments. It is a differing of the culture and the law. Walter Mosley, embarrassing. James Gunn, hypocritical. Kevin Hart, childish. But none have had the full might of the presidency thrust upon them. Devil in a Blue Dress is on TCM this week. Surely Mr. Hart and Mr. Gunn have plenty of work ahead, not Mr. Kaepernick. Imagine if I had strolled into my boss's office last Monday, dressed in jack boots, goose stepping and complaining about how George Soros was attempting to utilize mass media to make everybody adore Barbara Streisand. Seriously, Rob, what do you think would have happened to me besides getting hauled off to Bellevue? Let's not confuse free speech with the First Amendment. Paul in Long Beach. Paul, that was a great letter. And uh, you're absolutely correct. I don't know if Colin Kaepernick is the only person, but uh, I, I definitely, I very much appreciate your point. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> one of the things that American uh, schools are not teaching kids anymore is civics. We're not learning about our government, how our government works. We're not learning at both at a local level, a federal level, state level, all of these things. We're not being taught them anymore, and I think it's to the detriment of all of us, and certainly our understanding of the United States Constitution is limited. And there's a reason why that our founding fathers are smart enough to realize that we should have amendments, because things change, stuff changes. And the idea that, for instance, the Second Amendment, you know, everybody's always pointing to it and trying to subvert or 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 it's it's pretty clear what it says it was written at a time where we didn't have standing armies the way we do now i mean there was things were different and to assume that our forefathers meant that everybody could carry around uh, an, a semi-automatic handgun with them might not exactly have been the case who knows i am not a i'm not a constitutional scholar nor do i i don't even play one here on the internet but i know that that these interpretations are important and they need to be spoken of and taught in our schools. We need to learn the basis of our government, the constitution, the bill of rights, all of these things. And uh, we need, we need uh, Americans everywhere need a better understanding. So Paul, first of all, I appreciate your humor. Your funny letters always crack me up. Love it. Uh, JB Bonifacio says, uh, <laughs> <laughs> J.B. Bonfacio says, speaking of sexuality, I'm ready for Raylo in episode nine. Uh, for those who might not know what J.B. is talking about, Raylo is, of course, the new music video by my beloved Oral Knots. Uh, and if you haven't seen Raylo, as in Kylo Ren and Ray, do yourself a favor. I don't want to talk any more about it. It's the techno song. It's the dance track of the year. And if you want to have fun, if you haven't seen it yet, you're a Star Wars fan, even if you're not. You got to go watch the Oral Knots, and that's A U R A L N A U N A U T S, Oral Knots. Uh, check it out because Raylo is worth watching. The Oral Knots are, of course, one of the, the God's gifts to the internet. Love them all. Uh, David Galvez says Hey, RMB, Christian Harloff is leaving Collider. Is it possible we can see an ultimate team up of you, John, and Christian? No comment. No comment. <laughs> I knew Christian was leaving. Uh, uh, I, I think it's good. As you know, I've been a part of the the, the movie trivia Schmodown for a while. And uh, I, I really love what Christian and Mark have done with the movie trivia Schmodown. Those guys really bust their ass. I think Christian's a great guy. Uh, I All of my dealings with him have been wonderful. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what the future holds. I, I really don't. But... If you're asking me if you're if if you can see an ultimate team up of myself, John Campia and and Kristen Harloff, I can only say no comment. That's all I can say. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I think I'm going to bring an end to this Rob Observations episode 239. I can't believe I've still got you people watching me after 239 episodes. I'm surprised that nobody has found me, hunted me down, and put me into a body bag somewhere and thrown me into the ocean. But I want to thank you for not doing so, and thank you for still being here. Thank you for supporting the channel. Thanks for still being great imagination connoisseurs. 
and it is Joker Day. I'm going to go with Elizabeth. We're going to go see Joker uh, with John Campia and Christian Harloff, as far as I understand. Uh, I, I think we're all going, and I can report back later tomorrow and talk about my impressions. I will certainly on the John Campia show. I will be on tomorrow. I'll be here again for episode number 240. My God. And, uh, yeah, there's going to be some more interesting announcements about a new show that I'm doing. There's going to be a new show, ladies and gentlemen, a new show related to a certain specific franchise I'm going to be doing on this channel. I've decided to repurpose something I did a while ago into the, my first episode, and that's going to be dropping soon. Uh, the first episode will not be a live episode, though. Anyway, it's very exciting, and I want to thank you guys and girls and gentle people and beings and aliens and uh, whatever your beliefs, whatever your sexuality is, whatever you choose to identify as. I'm happy to have you here. This is a place where everybody is welcome. You're all imagination connoisseurs, and you all make up this, the post-geek singularity community. So I'm going to bring this chat to an end. I once again want to thank my moderators. There's going to be a new moderator. But for the time being, we've still got Terry, the Sheriff of Nottingham. We've got the Honorable Mayor Mike Bodden, whose re-election race in Riverdale, Iowa, is heating up. Vote for Mike. Um, if there's any way we can stuff the ballot box, we should. No, I'm just kidding. We don't want to interfere with any kind of election. No election shenanigans from us. And I also want to thank, of course, Detective Jim and Greg Smith. Greg's still building. He promises me videos. He's still building his one-to-one -one scale snowspeeder. I haven't seen it. And I don't know if Jim has his passport yet. Uh, Jim, buddy, got to get your passport to go see no, no Time to Die in England. We're all going to be in London but, uh, the first week of April. Remember, it's going to be, I think, April 2nd. We're going to be in Leicester Square at the Odeon Cinema to see the 25th James Bond movie. Everyone's invited. I can't afford to get anybody there myself except Detective Jim. Uh, but everybody else, hey, it's going to be a, a raucous time. We'll have a great weekend traveling uh through blighty and and terry's going to show us all the the bars and places he used to hang out or still does because i'm looking forward to that we'll take some ecstasy we'll go bar hopping who knows what's going to happen no i'm just kidding what what would i say to detective jim if i was encouraging us to take illegal drugs i couldn't i couldn't look him in the face but anyway i want to thank you for being here and remember every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear and all you have to do is listen. And with that, I bring this, Rob's Observations number 239 to an end. If you like these shows, please hit like, please subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? Only good things. And with that, go see Joker. Have a better day.